Hi, I'm Mel Van Dusen, and welcome to the show. You know, when I st first started interviewing people, I interviewed um, a woman named Nadia McCaffrey. And Nadia had three near-death experiences which completely changed her uh, outlook on life and also her outlook on death. And she explained in detail what the near-death experience was. And it just so happened that the day after the film showed, our neighbor called us. And she said, you know, the way this was presented, it, it really opened up the possibility that there may be uh, some consciousness after death after all. Well, a week after she told us this, she had to go to the hospital to have work done on an on a aortic aneurysm, I think it was. And the surgery was expected to go well, and she was expecting to come home. Well, the surgery went well, but her kidneys failed, and she became paralyzed on one side. And she decided that rather than live this way, she would just go home and die. We went to visit her. her uh, she approached the whole thing with dignity and grace and put us at ease. But the thing that really came home for me was that uh, the day before she died, she turned to her granddaughter and said, I see Bob, and Bob is waiting for me. I know that he's waiting for me. And when I heard that, uh, it made me realize that you know, if I can do a show on near-death experiences and have this kind of effect on people, then I've really done something worthwhile. So our guest tonight um, is one of the original researchers on the near-death experience. She has the largest research base of both children and adult experiencers. She's written seven books based on her research. She's um, lectured twice at the United Nations. She's appeared on uh, Geraldo, uh, Regis Philbin, and Kathy Lee, I think it is, mm -hmm. and Entertainment Tonight, and uh, Larry King Live, and now she's with us today. And she's written these seven books, and they are um, Beyond the Light, We Live Forever, Beyond the Indigo Children, Coming Back to Life, it's about the after effects of the near-death experience, and my hand is <laughs> barely able to hold all this, and Children of the New Millennium, it's children's near-death near experiences. I'm going to have to put some of these down. Uh, the new children and near-death experiences, future memory, and the one that I can relate to most accurately, and that one is The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Near-Death Experience. This is a really fun book, and I highly recommend it. It answers all your questions. So having told you what, uh, <coughs> excuse me, after what my guest is about and what she's done, I would like to introduce P.M.H. Atwater. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Dr. Atwater, welcome finally. <laughs> finally, we've got this thing off the show. We had a long time trying to get the tapes going, but we're finally here. Yes, we are. Now, you've been interviewed by many, many people yes, over quite a while, and I imagine most people have, you know, stock questions they start out with, but I'd like to not do that. Okay. Um, what question would you like me to ask you to get open up this whole subject. What's unique about the near-death experience? Uh, PMH, what is unique about the near-death experience? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what excites me about the near-death experience, because so many people try to compare it to other types of experiences or other, other types of changing consciousness or altered consciousness, and they'll say, well, it's oxygen deprivation, or it's um, connected to ketamine, or drugs, or this, or that. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about shamanic experiences, and vision quests, and spiritual experiences. And it's really kind of part of all of that. But what makes it unique is of all of these different experiences, it is the most intense, the most clear, the most coherent, mm -hmm. the most remembered over time, mm -hmm. decades later. Mm -hmm. And it has a pattern of after effects that's both physiological and psychological that really validate these, this experience and says that very clearly it's not a hallucination, no way could it be. 
It's not oxygen deprivation. No way could it be. It's not any kind of hallucination that we know of, that we have records of, that it's even more than anything we can imagine. But of all of the different kinds of experiences people can have, including baptism of the Holy Spirit, or the vision quest, or the shamanic experience, or the spiritual experience, it's one that most often happens at an accident scene or in a hospital room. It's almost as if we are being given this incredibly lustrous and complicated and awesome and mind-stretching experience that happens where a doctor or a nurse or a scientist can investigate it. It's almost as if it's made to order for the technological age. Mm -hmm. And what do the machines show has happened when this near-death experience happens? Most of them, not all of them, mm -hmm. but most of them happen at that point of death where there's no vital signs at all, no heartbeat, no pulse, no breath, no, you know, involvement of lungs, and the brain is flatlined. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of skeptics have said, well, the brain obviously is not dead. We know now through clinical study that is not true, that most of these cases, in fact, and clinical prospective study, that most of these cases, the brain is flatlined. Mm -hmm. So how can you have uh, your consciousness, your ability to perceive and respond to reality that's actually hyper. You can hear better, you can see better, you can smell better, you can respond better, you are capable of movement, you're capable of thought, mm -hmm. you can tell jokes if you want to, yeah. you, you can do, do anything <laughs> you want without <laughs> that body. Okay, how is that possible? Well, we can't define that, of course, mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. as researchers, but we know that it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard some uh, research reports. I think Pim Van Lommel. The, the Van guy, Lommel. Van Lommel. No, Got to be a good German here. Lommel. Van Lommel. The guy who uh, wrote a, a groundbreaking article at Lancet. Oh, yes. He said that I, I think he said that people who have been born blind can see during a near-death experience. They can actually see their body, they can see what's going on around, they can report what they saw. He didn't research that as much as mm -hmm. Ken Ring did. Oh, I see. But he was the one that was able to prove that the brain is flatlined mm -hmm. and that there's no way that the individual who has these experiences can, de can describe what's the going on in the other room, mm -hmm. can describe what's going on to them and their body, mm -hmm. um, can uh, describe what's going on in their home. The individual leaves the body, maybe goes home. Um, he was able to prove that there's no way any of this is possible to occur, mm -hmm. and he was able to prove that scientifically. And by the way, he was able to verify some of my research, and I'm in the Lancet study. Oh, you are? Yes, I am. Oh, I didn't know that. You know, that, that was uh, December 15, 2001, mm -hmm. and I told everybody, by golly, I won an Oscar for Christmas. <laughs> you know, I'm in Lancet, uh -huh. and that's uh -huh. pretty good. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, when I've heard that when people have these experiences, they, well, for one thing, they go through a tunnel, and... Uh, well, sometimes. Uh, some, well, that's true. Now that I think about it, you know, there are classic... There's not that many that go through a tunnel. May I speak? <laughs> yeah. I, I heard there, there are different stages of the near-death experience, but which I've heard that not many, that everyone goes through, but you've come up with a different set of criteria, which is more, what would you say? It fits the experience. Yeah. Could you tell us about that? Well, first of all, I'd like to comment on the, on the tunnel. Go ahead. Uh, the first survey that was ever done, scientific survey, uh -huh. by Gallup Poll, right. on the near-death experience was 1982. Yes. At that time, there were only 9% of the people, the experiencers, who ex um, reported anything even near a tunnel. Mm -hmm. We didn't get people reporting tunnels until after 
Raymond Moody's book, uh -oh. that breakthrough book, mm -hmm. you know, Life After Life, mm -hmm. until after that was sensationalized by the media. Mm -hmm. Then and then only did we get this rash of tunnels. So what does that mean? It, well, in my research base, less than a third ever reported a tunnel. Mm -hmm. I think what it means is that when you have this kind of experience, how do you describe it? What are the words you can use? Our language, in English language, does not uh, encompass these kinds of experiences. So finally they have a word, and they say, oh yes, oh yes, it must have been a tunnel. Mm -hmm. So we get more people reporting tunnels now, and, and if, you, if, you, if you are with them for a while and engage them for a while and say, describe it, mm -hmm. invariably they're talking about maybe darkness or a swirl or some kind of maybe uh, suffocating or closed environment. Uh, an element of that, an aspect of that they go through, mm -hmm. and you say, is that really a tunnel? And they'll say, well, that's the only kind of word that I've heard right, right. Uh -huh. that I'm using. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. some of them, yes, tunnels, but the majority, no. The tunnel is not a signature feature of the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. The out-of-body experience is. Mm -hmm. Uh, when most people question, have that. When people report that they're out of their body, do they are they able to look down at themselves and see what they've got as a body in this other state? Mm -hmm, very often. What do they tell you? What do they report? What do they describe it? They describe the body, yes. What does it look like? And um, it looks like what it looks like, but to them it's like, <gasps> I'm down there, but yet I'm up here. But the body How up can that be? But the body up here, what does that look like? the body that has left the body. Yes. Okay. For those that describe that, it seems more ephemeral, it seems more gaseous, it seems more, they call it spirit, mm -hmm. or spirit-like. But it's not something that's particularly well, defined? Well, sometimes it's definable, sometimes it has features, Sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your near-death experience. You've had three. Oh, we're going to, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and I'd like to know uh, how it changed you and, and what blew you away when you had the experience. Whole thing. Yeah, but conci be concise because I have to ask you some more questions. <laughs> I'm being concise oh. the whole thing. All right, all right. It was so, for me, mm -hmm. it was so, Again, you know, how do you find words? It, it was so, it was so awesome. That, that would be the word I would use. It was so you, awesome mm -hmm. that I just can't place it in anything else. Mm -hmm. I can't put a cover on it. I can't put a label on it. You couldn't have imagined it. No, couldn't have dreamed it, couldn't have imagined it. No way, mm -hmm. no way, okay. no way, couldn't have done that. And when you came back? I couldn't relate to this world. It took me a long time. Mm -hmm. It was almost as if I was still over there. When I right. came back, I really wasn't back. Yeah. I was still no, over there. That's what Nadia said. She said when she I was came, still over there. When Nadia was telling me about her experience, um, she said, you know, being in this world is just so very, very difficult. After having experienced that, what makes this world so hard? When I came back, I couldn't recognize a bed, I couldn't recognize a newspaper, I couldn't recognize a clock, I couldn't recognize my children, I couldn't recognize clothes, eating, was, was this because any of, the, of this. the near-death experience, or was it because it's of... It's because of my near-death experience. It was so, I mean, I was still over there, mm -hmm. and my consciousness when I revived, was now in this body, my mm -hmm. physical body, mm -hmm. but I couldn't relate to it. It's right. like, what's a physical body? Right. What's a child? I'm a mm -hmm. mother, but what's a child? Mm -hmm. What's a newspaper? Mm -hmm. What's food? Mm -hmm. um, I had no concept of eating, mm -hmm. no concept of uh, putting one foot in front of another. 
no concept anymore of a weighty, dense body that you move over in bed. Or other people wearing weighty, dense bodies, looking at me. Were there any it was completely foreign. Were there any circumstances under which you felt okay? I was neither okay or not okay. Truly, in my case, I was lost between wor wor worlds. Right. And the only logical thought that got through to me, believe it or not, was money. Oh, really? Three days later. <laughs> Uh -huh. It hit me with thunder that I had to go to work, my job was my only source of income, and I had to get up out of this bed and go to work. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in Silicon Valley, and we're surrounded by mathematicians, engineers, people working with computers. For me, it's pretty dull. <laughs> no, no, it really is. And, you know, and if you, you know, when you, I can imagine that some of these people who are involved in these things, if they haven't turned off the TV already, <laughs> if they're still listening, they're thinking, well, now, come on, this is not logical. It doesn't follow a sequential pattern, you know. After A, there's B, and then after, you know, you know how it is. And uh, in a way, they're, they're kind of a, a squirrel on a treadmill. You know, mm -hmm. they have to keep referring back to what they know. And, and after a while, I think their world becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. You know, the arts don't particularly flourish around here. Oh, really? The, the arts, what a, yeah. But um, how do you get through to these people? No, we don't want to be insulting, but... All you have to do is pre present the facts. Yeah. All you have to do is pre present the stories. Mm -hmm. They speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, considering how they've been conditioned in their thinking, uh, their conditioning has conditioned them out of accepting anything like this. Like my f some of my technical friends were t will tell me, um, you know, that's illogical. Everything has to be logical at the, at the beginning. It has to refer back to something that they know is provable. But when you have something that uh, blows the top of your head off, you know, it, it has none of those references anymore, does it? Maybe we should just go on. May, you know, again, <laughs> again, it's just seeing those facts. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, George Rodanaya, when he had his experience. Who? George Rodanaya. Uh -huh. And part of his experience was getting into his wife's mind, he being a corpse, Mm -hmm. in, a, in a freezer vault in a morgue, mm -hmm. his wife with two young children picking out his gravesite and standing at the gravesite in her, in, in her mind going through the various men now that she might acquaint herself with and maybe date because she now needed a father for her children. So she's going in her mind, naming them and going through their various attributes, pros and cons. He then, being in her mind, seeing everything she's seeing in the cemetery, mm -hmm. hearing everything she's saying in her mind, mm -hmm. viewing the various pictures she has in her mind, and when he finally revived at the end of three days, an incredible story of George Rodanaya, I talk about it in Beyond the Light. Mm -hmm. Talk about a stone-cold corpse. He certainly was that. And when he was able to talk again, mm -hmm. he described to her word for word everything she had said, everything she had seen, everything she had done. And she was so freaked out and so shocked that she wouldn't have anything to do with him for a year hmm. mm -hmm. after he came back. And I, her name is Nino. I interviewed Nino, too. And I, and I said to Nino, How, what's your feelings? What's your response to what happened to you? And she said, you know, why, why couldn't you stand this guy for all year? Wouldn't even be in the same bedroom with him. And she said, well, how would you like it if your husband knows every thought you think? Hmm. How could you live with that? Mm -hmm. That kind of accuracy, that there is absolutely no privacy, none. Hmm. And that was her experience in living with this man who had come back to life, revived. He revived, by the way, on the autopsy table. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. To the shock 
of uh, the doctors at present. Mm -hmm. uh, they had done uh, what was called the, the, the T-square. How long was he technically dead? Three days. He was in, what did they, that they stick the knife? Were they ready to stick the knife in it? They'd already done that. Oh, God. They had done what was called the T-cut. Did that wait? Oh, so, okay. so the lower part had been split open. Uh -huh. They were splitting open the trunk of the body uh -huh. when he opened his eyes. Well, that's really kind of like a natural response. So the doctors didn't think anything of it. What, they they stuck simply a knife closed into? his eyes. Oh, oh I, see, I see. And, and kept going. You know, a natural response of the yeah, body, yeah, a, yeah. Re a reflex. Right. And they kept cutting. And he opened his eyes again. And again, they didn't think anything of it. Closed his eyes, kept cutting. And uh, about halfway up the trunk now, opened his eyes for the third time, and the head of autopsy screamed, stepped backward, and had to take a two-month vacation. <laughs> he, he couldn't complete. And herein, I'm about ready for that after hearing this. <laughs> herein we have the case of George Rodanaya. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it, like two years of surgeries to put this guy back together again. Mm -hmm. Because he would, he had been uh, assassinated by the KGB. Right, right. I think you've got your point ago, across. But um, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, some, you know, some. I of you, mean, how do you explain this? Yeah, you know, some of these people who hear about near-death experiences, they complain, "Oh, well, you know, they weren't really dead. Well, they may have flatlined, but there must be an explanation for that. You know, wherever they are. But in this case, you know, when you're on the, I mean, what what do these people want? Do they want you? come back after total decomposition? I mean, is that going to convince them? I mean, but in this case, where he was on the autopsy table and he's being cut up, um, you know, that's, that's you know, that might get... We have a number of dramatic cases like that. Right. His is not the only one. Did you one. see the light? Yeah, yes, I did. Can you tell us what To me, that? it was all encompassing. It wasn't a light, meaning a beam or a spot. Mm -hmm. It was everything, everywhere, mm -hmm. was that light. And what, how did that feel to you? My sense of that was being in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Had you? And it was awesome. Is that? I use that word again. Uh -huh. It's the only word I can use. Uh -huh. And did, awesome. did that experience of God coincide at all with what you'd been told about God before? How can you tell anybody what the presence of God is. No religion can do it. No holy book can do it. But no they, article can do it. Mm -hmm. No novel can do it. It's being there consumed by that power that is so beyond power that it dissolves identity, it dissolves cells, it dissolves molecules, it dissolves even naked, nakedness, it dissolves everything. It is so powerful, again, it's beyond power. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I can't describe for you mm -hmm. what that's like. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody else can either. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself gravitating toward other people who've had these experiences? Do you like to hang out with I like to hang out with everybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> because I came That's back with that sense that everybody was my brother or my sister. You experienced love. I experienced total love, total oneness. Mm -hmm. No divisions anymore. I had to relearn the fact that we do have relationships that are supposed to be exclusive. And you want to comment on that? <laughs> well. <laughs> You know, I, I, I had equal love for everybody. Mm -hmm. And my children resented that. They really did. They resented that. My daughter they wanted Natalie, exclusive love. My from daughter came to me and said, I want to be exclusive to you, special to you. I don't want you to love me like you love every kid on the block. Which is what you were doing I after want, that. Exclusive you know, I want, yeah, attention. Yeah, I want to be special. Mm -hmm. And so I had to sort of invent that or play act that until I could sort of get in the hang of it. Mm -hmm. So one of the after effects is kind of disillusion of boundaries in a way, I would think. They're gone. Well, what does that mean for people? It, it creates it some difficulty. It means a lot of confusion. 
it yeah. means let's depression. Say, let's say you had this experience of all-encompassing love and you wanted to express that in the workplace. It's the, mount, it's, <laughs> it's the mountaintop experience. It's the rooftop experience. You want to get on your roof and say, there's no such thing as death and God is. Mm -hmm. You know, wake up humanity. Mm -hmm. Wake up humankind. There really is God. Mm -hmm. And there really is oneness. Right. And you want to you, you want to say that to everybody, and everybody thinks you're psychotic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you belong in a psychiatric in institution, mm -hmm. and you learn to either shut up, or use your words differently. Right, uh, Dr. Atwater, we have about two minutes left, less Ooh. than that, I think, and I have many, many, many more questions, and uh, you know, pages and pages of questions, and you would like to talk, I think, about the near-death experience of children, which are completely different than adults. Well, the experience isn't different, we can't but do it how now. they respond we to them is different. <laughs> 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 yeah, we can't do it now, but I would like to invite you to come back and talk about that. Oh, I'd love you? to. I would love to. Good. Will you do that? Yeah. Good. You Good. Bet. And uh, one of the books that deals exclusively with... Uh, exclusive the New Children and Near-Death Experiences, uh -huh. the big one on top of the idiot's I'll book. I'll take your word for it. Okay. Okay. All right. I would like to thank the crew for um, going through this ordeal to put this show together. <laughs> I think it took us an hour and a half to finally get the cameras rolling, but I'm so glad it happened. And I'm glad for your patience and, and sitting here for all that time under these glaring lights that I've never got used to. I'm, I, I'm used to light. I mean... I know. You've been in it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, light. <laughs> okay. I hope this show has been... Um, helpful to some of you people. I hope you can open your mind to it. I hope you tune in for the next show when we'll talk about children's near-death experiences. It was a mind opener for me. I'd like to invite you back for that and thank you for viewing this time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And thank you. Thank you.